bring the mind to the breath in a friendly way. If you treat the meditation as a, as a war, the mind is going to fight. But if you treat it as a process of creating friendship, developing a, a friendly relation with the present moment, the mind will soften into the present moment and be a lot more willing to, to settle in, to make itself comfortable, to make itself at home. The sense of comfort is really important, because there's so much difficult work that's going to have to be done. So there has to be a sense of well-being to strengthen the mind, to keep it going. If it doesn't have that sense of strength, that sense of well-being, when it runs into defilements, when it runs into problems right here in the present moment, it's going to run away. It's not going to want to deal with them. But if you come at the issues in the mind, with a sense of strong well-being, a sense that you're really stable and at home, and friends with the breath, friends with the present moment. Then you can face the issues in the mind with a lot more confidence. So this foundation is very important. One time one of John Fuang's students complained that she'd been meditating a couple of years, and all he was teaching her was concentration. And she was impatient to get on to the next step, and he said, look, it's like you're building a a very tall building here. The foundation has to be solid. If the foundation isn't solid, then you build one or two stories and the whole thing collapses. If the foundation is really solid, though, then it doesn't matter how many stories you build, they won't fall down. So this work on the foundation is important. It requires a lot of care, a lot of skill, a lot of dedication. But think of the alternative. An unstable mind, an unbalanced mind, a mind with no foundation, is that what you want? There's only way you can gain that kind of mind, and that's by doing the work, by being willing to train the mind. The training here isn't so much reading and thinking about things, it's more actually developing qualities of the mind through working with it. It's more like character building. And a lot of character building comes from doing things you don't want to do, <clears throat> but learning how to make yourself want to do them. That's that quality of chanda, or desire, in the practice. Inclining yourself to doing things that sometimes seem very hard. But as you contemplate the alternatives, and think of the good results that are going to come from buckling down and doing the practice you get a sense of encouragement. It becomes something you really do want to do. And the obstacles start seem, seeming smaller and smaller and smaller. Years back when I was staying with the John Fu, there was a time we were getting ready to consecrate all those amulets that were going to be put in the Buddha image. And someone suggested doing a nine-day, nine-night consecration ceremony, which nobody had ever heard of. Usually it's just a all-night affair, and then you're done with it. And John Fu himself seemed kind of dubious about whether we should attack all nine days and nine nights. But for some reason, I spoke up and said, yeah, let's do it. And later he credited me with having the whole thing having succeeded, just because of that sense of, yeah, let's do it. The obstacles seemed small. And the same principle works in the practice, so your willingness to have that, well, let's just do it attitude. Sounds like a Nike commercial. But you just do it in the sense that it's something that you really want to do. And when you have that sense, then the obstacles just seem to melt away. And even when they still are difficult, you find ways around them. It's like the difference between two people lost in the forest. One person believes there's no way out. Well, that person is never going to find any way out. They just give up at the least, least obstacle. But the person who believes that, yes, there is a way out, has a good chance of finding the way out, 
So that's the attitude you've got to have. There is a way out of all the sufferings that the mind suffers from. All the stress and distress and despair and delusionment and depression, all these other negative things in the mind, there is a way out of them. That's one of the best things you can do in life, when you have that kind of attitude and the difficulties in the practice start seeming easy. And when it's backed up by a well-trained mind, especially trained in concentration, that gives the mind the added strength it needs so it's not just an empty bombast or false self-esteem, but something that's based on real strength. So this is something we have to work on as we practice, while we keep coming back to the breath, working with the breath. is to create that kind of strength, to create that kind of well-being that really is solid, that can tackle obstacles. Because look at what we've got to tackle. A lot of things that the mind likes most. As John Sweat once said, our problem is that we have our friendships backwards. We're friends with our craving, and we take suffering as our enemy. We should turn that around, take suffering as our friend, because it teaches us a lot of lessons. We regard craving as our enemy. Our desires, our likes, you have to watch out for those things. So it's not an easy task. Often the lessons we most have to learn in the practice are the ones we least want to learn. And only two ways around it. One is listening to the counsel of other people who, looking at us from the outside, can see what that problem is. And through our own appropriate attention, so asking questions about our likes, questioning our assumptions. Dogen wants to describe the practice as de-thinking your thinking. In other words, it's not just that you stop thinking, but it's you start questioning your attitudes, your assumptions about this is good and that's bad. Well, look at it. Is it really what you thought it was? Look deeper. Learn how to question it. It's learning the appropriate questions. Appropriate questions. That's what appropriate attention means. It's Finding a good question to ask about your assumptions and following it through, taking them apart. And these are the two factors that can open things up in the mind. The Buddha said the two things that are most, most helpful, one is having an admirable friend, someone who's more advanced in the practice, and then our own appropriate attention. These two factors work together from the inside and from the outside to help chip away at the assumptions, our likes and our dislikes, the things we want, the things we say we don't want. Well, we have to look at them, be willing to step back from them, and see where they lead. Do they really take us where we want to go, or just pile on more stress and suffering? So work hard at this business of concentration this work of concentration. The work comes down to two factors, mindfulness and alertness, or as they get more developed, what they call directed thought and evaluation. Mindfulness means keeping the breath in mind. Alertness means just watching what's happening. It's like driving down the road. You learn lessons in driver's ed, then you have to remember them. And as you're driving down the road, be alert to situations that you learned about. It's the same with a breath. You make up your mind you're going to stay with a breath, and then you're alert to make sure you really do stay with a breath. Remind yourself of your, your original intention. Don't let it fall away. Don't be a traitor to yourself. And it's a combination of these two factors that develop into the factors of jhana, directed thought and evaluation. Just keep bringing your mind to the breath with greater consistency, greater precision. At the same time, start evaluating the breath. Be really alert to what's going on and adjusting it and fixing it so that it's just right, so the mind really does feel good there. That's the work we do in our meditation, to create a sense of well-being in the present moment. And it's work that's worth doing, and as you find that you get into it, it's not so much dealing with pain in the present moment, but your work that starts getting involved in pleasure, a sense of even rapture, the energy that starts coming up as the mind finally begins to settle down and have a sense of solidity right here. 
It's food for the mind that keeps it strong. It gives it the strength it's going to need to develop further strength, the strength of discernment, the strength of insight. that can start uprooting all those assumptions that you've always left unquestioned. You can step back from the habits of the mind that you've maybe might have worked when you were a kid, but just aren't working anymore. Habits that say, well, this has to be this and that has to be that. Well, does it really have to be? Look at it. Take it apart. And when you can do that, you find the mind has even greater strength, so it doesn't need to depend on the things it used to cling to, the things it used to take as its food and nourishment. It gets to the point where it doesn't need anything outside anymore. Outside here meaning any of the five khandhas, even thoughts and feelings inside the mind. It gets so it doesn't need those either for the sake of its well-being. It may not be easy work, but it's the best work around. <laughs>